to um, enhancing your nursing career through social media. Uh, it's interesting that um, on the last panel, we uh, had nursing and computer use uh, come up so often. And of course, there's the whole aspects of, of uh, digital record keeping. Um, but Rob is also an expert in uh, enhancing your career through sharing uh, your, your nursing findings, your breakthroughs, your challenges, uh, and your successes. He um, we do have the full profile in the program, so I'll, I'll keep us on, on track um, and tell you to read it because he has a very interesting background. Um, while still an undergraduate, he launched a website called Nursing Idea, then suddenly he was uh, sharing uh, with nurses all over the planet. Um, since this is an IEM conference, this is uh, completely appropriate, I think. So without further ado, here's Rob Fraser. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, Tina. Um, I'm really excited to be here and uh, leave it to the technology presenter to have issues with technology. Uh, but I think I have my uh, presentation working now um, and I'm just going to move down here. Uh, it's just uh, fantastic to be here with uh, IENs and I enjoyed the panel. Um, I was actually working this morning at Covenant House, so I, I just caught the last one. But uh, to hear um, just some of the issues and things that you guys are working with. Um, I actually worked at York University for a while uh, in their simulation lab, so I had the opportunity to work in part of their um, internationally educated program. Uh, so I do have a little bit of experience, but today I'm really here to talk about social media. And I'm actually going to start um, not by doing something, but asking you guys a few questions. Um, so if you're an internationally educated nurse, uh, would you please stand up for a minute and stay standing? So internationally educated nurses, stand up. Okay. Uh, if you're a domestically educated staff nurse, would you stand up? Okay, so one or two in the room. If you're a nursing educator, would you please stand up? Any nursing educators around? Okay. If you're a nursing uh, professional association or regulator, would you stand up? Okay, and anyone else, uh, please just stand up for now. Okay. <laughs> so now that we're all standing, um, have a seat um, if it's been more than a week since on, uh, you've gone online at home. You can sit down. No? Okay, good. Uh, sit down if you um, don't uh, use a smartphone or a tablet or uh, your own uh, personal computing device. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sit down um, if um, you've never ever searched for personal health information um, about a disease related to yourself or a caregiver. Okay. Uh, sit down if you've uh, ever searched for, a, or you never searched for a job online. Okay. Now, Stay standing if you are currently using social media to advance your career. Anyone? Okay. Good. Nice. So maybe these are some co-presenters. Uh, stay standing. So um, stand up if you've ever posted a video related to health or healthcare education. Good. Stay standing if you've done that. So if you have a video online right now that you've posted about healthcare or health education, stay standing. Good. Um, so lots of people who have some experience. And stay standing if you're doing analytics or tracking um, uh, anything that you've posted online. So if you do measurements uh, and know how many views you have of the videos, great. Okay, so if anyone gives me some tough questions, these are the people that I'll, that I'll direct to, uh, to help me uh, lead this. Um, <laughs> so have a seat. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to see uh, this change over time, uh, the differing perspectives. and. Um, when I first got started with this, uh, I'd ask often about smartphones, and it was 2005, and only nursing managers or higher-ups um, had Blackberries, and most people said, oh, I don't need a Blackberry, I'll never use that device. And now these devices are everywhere, uh, and uh, internet access is changing, uh, and uh, there's new websites every day uh, that are coming online, and uh, I'm really excited to talk about how these are tools that we can uh, use. 
Um, and uh, although I'll be focused on social media, my background is, uh, is diverse. I've worked in research, I've worked in education, uh, internal medicine as a staff nurse, I'm in community care now. I've done some work internationally uh, and uh, traveled a fair bit. So I'm happy to answer questions uh, related to any of that. Um, but today um, I, I have my slides and I'd love it if you have questions while I'm presenting for you to ask your, your questions. Because I'm here to, to try to relate and uh, solve your, your problems and give you some insights. Um, and uh, I need to hear from you to know what they are. But hopefully uh, you'll get something out of the slides that I have prepared if you guys decide to remain quiet. Uh, and if you're at all interested in um, actually getting the slides, they're already posted. They're on my website, um, robertfraser.ca slash um, slides, so you can download them. Uh, and if any of you are using Twitter, I know some of you stayed standing, so you have social media accounts, um, join in the discussion. Uh, share your thoughts uh, about this conference and about this day. And anyone that actually tweets with that, um, hashtag, um, so post something online. Uh, with that hashtag and mentions my Twitter handle, uh, within a week I'm going to draw and give away uh, a book. So uh, please do join in. And does anyone recognize the person standing on the right of this slide? Florence, Florence Nightingale. Okay. Yeah. So we all know who this is. Uh, and if it's you're in the back, it's a I heart uh, Twitter and Facebook in your in your thought bubble. Uh, I had the privilege of doing a talk uh, for Nursing Week. Um, at Southlake uh, a few years ago, and they asked me this question, uh, do you think social media uh, would be something that Florence would use? And my conclusion after thinking about it is absolutely. Um, she was a pioneer. She was a political advocate. She was in uh, the public forums discussing health issues, uh, trying to advocate for people. She was using cutting edge analytics and statistics. Um, any tool that was coming out, she was kind of pioneering. And she, she was writing books. She was using the available technology at the time to share her knowledge and practice. So I think if she was around today, she'd also be encouraging social media use. Uh, and that's my bias. Uh, maybe one day we'll know what she really thinks. And where this comes from is I've always seen technology as an enabler. Uh, my personal experience, uh, uh, first technology, was uh, an iPod. Uh, this was a big game changer for me. So I got this in high school. And uh, often people are thinking uh, when these first came out, you can go onto Napster, these file sharing sites, and download music, and people will just listen to music. I had a job where I had to drive for six hours on a tractor a day. And I thought a little bit differently. Uh, I found lectures um, that I was excited by, good speakers, uh, and audiobooks that I really enjoyed, and I'd listen while I was driving around. Um, and it, it was a great way to learn. So that's Richard Feynman on the left, a uh, physicist, and he has some great lectures if, if that's what you like. Uh, but then I found other books about topics that I was interested in, uh, and I kept on learning and using that time to develop myself. Uh, as Loy was saying, continuing to develop is so key uh, to advancing our, our capacity and what we can do. Um, and, oh, the build. Uh, I guess the export broke. Uh, but what I was going to talk about is once I got to um, Ryerson in my nursing degree, um, I was going to conferences like this. Uh, and I was like, great, I have a profession and I want to learn more. I'm going to go and download lectures. I'm going to go to download um, things so I can listen to them and continue to develop that education. Or go back to my class and talk about what I had learned. And my my colleagues uh, were, were burdened with papers. They had children. They couldn't go to the conferences necessarily. So I was like, oh, how come you, don't, you haven't heard about Joan Lesmond, uh, who I had the chance to actually meet, or, or X or Y person? And then I thought, what can I do with the technology I have to actually start to make an impact? So what I did was not to start to make a website about my knowledge, because uh, mine's still limited. I'm actually really an early career uh, professional, but I could use that technology to help experts tell their stories and share their passion and their, share their ideas. And that's what Nursing Ideas was really all about, getting them to sit down in a format that I could record and post online. I could use my skills and help them share what they were actually doing. And so I didn't know who would watch it at first, but I put it up. And then in the course of a year, about 25,000 people from around the world came uh, to watch some of these videos and ask questions. And I hadn't graduated from my undergraduate degree, and yet I could start to give back or contribute in a different way uh, using this technology. And that's what led to me uh, to opportunities to actually write the book um, on, the, on how nurses can use social media to advance their careers. So I hope that you guys see technology as an enabler 
and not just what it's labeled as, because an iPod is sold for music. Apple's uh, advertising focuses solely around this. But technology can always be used for different purposes. So how can we adapt these tools and use them for goals that we have with our patients, with our careers, um, with our healthcare profession? Uh, if you're passionate about something, how can you leverage these tools to make a difference? And I'm going to talk mostly about social media, but I'm going to give a little hat tip. Um, so one of the podcasts that I listen to for free that's been excellent career guidance for me is from a website called Manager-Tools. And they talk about two things that matter in a career. The first is relationships. The second is outcomes. Uh, and I think those are two critical um, career insights that were really valuable for me that I got from a social media source that I wanted to share and I encourage people to check it out because you can listen to it for free. And it speaks to the panel that was before uh, about um, going into a new workplace or going somewhere that you, you're not known. How can you really advance and, and fit in? Uh, building relationships, getting to know that nurse. Uh, if you're the nurse training someone that's new, building a relationship, finding about their culture, finding about uh, their headdress, finding about the languages they speak and um, developing your insights to be able to help different populations, figuring out where they have skills and where they can actually develop. And outcomes, I think it's a great thing to really think about is uh, what are the things that you're contributing? What are the things that you've done? How can you continually build those? Uh, and if you have those, um, I think you'll have a, an incredible career and it'll help you to, to advance. And now I'll get to uh, my kind of take on how you can use social media to do some of those things. So these are some of the basics that I'm, I'm gonna go through these kinds of sections. So we'll start really talking about the definition of social media. So what comes to mind um, when you hear the term social media? Anyone's first reaction? Facebook? Facebook? Some people just shut off, yeah. Uh, that's totally uh, legit. Uh, people have different reactions. So Facebook, any other things that uh, initially come to mind? YouTube. YouTube, Connections. yeah. Connections, that's a great one. Anything else? Twitter, yeah. And a quiet one over here. What was your answer over here? I heard a quiet uh, mumble. Education and learning, that's great. Uh, often when people talk about social media, they put up these icons, and it can be a little unhelpful at times uh, because there's so many new sites and it's always kind of changing. Um, so I like to, to look at definitions. And so when I went to the research in the academic literature, there's lots of complex uh, definitions to really try to nail this down. And if you want to um, look at some of those, uh, in my slides, if you follow this link, it's to an active library um, of all my references on social media and healthcare, um, so it doesn't go out of date. So feel free to check those out. But the definition that I like the most is this one. Enabling individuals to share and exchange or create information and ideas across telecommunications and social networks. So that's pretty basic. Um, and it comes from Wikipedia. It's evolved over time um, and changed. And it's nice because if you take out um, the last kind of section, you see a pattern. Enabling individuals to share ideas, um, exchange and create information and ideas. Um, and that's something we've been doing for a long time. It started with verbal communication, then it went on to hieroglyphics, the printing press, uh, and then slowly we've had things like email, and now videos on your mobile phones. It's just an evolution. Social media really isn't something that's going away, it's just we're seeing a change, a slow change in the tools that we have and the, the reach that we have in the ability to, to share ideas and to build relationships. And I think that makes it really approachable and not something that you have to stay up to date with the 15 newest sites, but more, you can really compare, okay, is this something that's relevant to me? Will it help me learn? Will it help me develop relationships or accomplish a goal that I actually have in my career or, or personal life? Um, and, and that's what I encourage. It's not to go up and sign up for 50 accounts based on what's new. It's to think about it, consider it. And if you don't want to be on Facebook, you don't have to open an account, but know why other people are using it. So if it becomes useful, um, I think many people in this room would have family overseas. So there may be a huge majority of people that use it. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. You can consider, is this going to help and support you? And how this kind of changes, and I'm sorry you can't see it, but you can see some light red dots. So this is a conference, and I talked about a hashtag for this conference. Um, so this was tracking on Twitter when people made a post. So they shared a message, um, and they put in that. So the pound sign 
helps people to search it so you can track in these millions of people that are talking, uh, who's actually talking about this Medicine X conference. And so they looked at the attendee list and there was 500 people attending and that was their network. And then they did an analysis looking at what happens when you look at people that weren't there and it lights up in a completely different way. All of a sudden, it almost triples the amount of people that are engaged in that dialogue and having conversation. And that's the incredible change that we're seeing uh, when we start to use these technologies. Has anyone heard of the a um, ALS Ice Bucket Challenge? Yes. Yeah, that went around the world in some really unexpected ways and raised a ton of money and awareness. And I'm not saying always think about being viral, but it really changes the action potential when you have a, a global reach. Uh, and if you can build through relationships or share information, it becomes accessible to whole new populations. And this is uh, interesting for patient education, for career development, and so many different things that we can do every day. Um, and the research shows us that people are going line, online looking for health information. And based on um, the demographics, yes, there are differences, but the overall trend is up and to the right. It's increasing. We're not seeing decreases in any age group uh, using it less, um, um, which is really interesting. And you can see um, that people are using it, and women tend to actually use it more for health-related questions. Any guesses as to what that might be? Children? Yeah. Caregivers. They are primarily caregivers in the, the follow-up surveys that they did. They're often looking to support other people. So people are looking for this information and they, they're looking at online reviews of medication. Uh, we know that they're coming in with more questions because they're doing this and it's changing the way we have to practice, but it's also giving us opportunities. I was at a discussion yesterday morning where they talked about the empowered patient cost the healthcare system less. If we can engage them in their own health, we can really make big differences in the costs. And if we free up resources by empowering one person, the people without those resources get more attention and ha can have more support, which is really important. And we should really think about this opportunity. How do we take not just the 10 hours on average of professional caregiving that someone might receive um, versus the 5,000 plus hours that they have of care and self-care that they do the rest of the year with their diabetes or asthma or other things that they're actually dealing with. So if we know that social media is something that's uh, graspable, how are these actually creating useful tools? And I'm going to talk about risks because every tool comes with a risk. Who here has knives in their house? <laughs> yeah, okay. And on the last panel they talked about children. Who gives children knives? No one. But over time, you let them handle it. You tell them what the risks are, and you teach them how to use these tools. Who here has used a needle before? Hands up. An injection syringe on themselves or a patient? Most of us. Who's given out a medication? Everyone. So are these things without risk? They all have risk. And when we think about digital tools, it's the same. We need to understand the risk because they're there, but also the advantages. So let's talk about some of the potential. Uh, something like a blog. Often people think about recipes and don't worry about the text, it's not important. I'm just showing you what it looks like. Uh, but people could go on and share recipes, their diaries, and that's what they want. This nurse, the nerdy nurse, uh, is actually doing a roundup um, uh, of different blogs. So she goes on and posts uh, once a week all the best nursing blogs and what the articles are about. So she's using it uh, to do professional networking and, and creating a resource um, uh, for nurses. Uh, a nurse in the UK is leading uh, We Nurses, which is now We Communities, uh, and it's weekly discussions using Twitter about professional topics. So a global conversation uh, about issues relevant to nurses, and now they're doing it with patients, they do it with physicians, to have discussions about topics that people care about. And the nice part is, when you're an expert in your own facility, you may only be one of a few. When you go online and find people that are passionate about wound care or uh, palliative care, mental health, whatever it is you're an expert at, you can find the experts that actually have experience. You can find patients and understand a bit more about their, their needs and their, their input on, on these things. And it's a really interesting dialogue to watch. And every week they have new topics and new sharings. And the NHS, the healthcare system in the UK, is now doing work where they're integrating some of this into their quality improvement planning, into their engagement of staff, into understanding how they can actually improve their healthcare system. 
uh, Facebook. We talked about it. And this is the Ottawa Hospital. And they're using it, uh, TUH Nurses, a page, to keep people engaged because they know that not everyone's checking their email all the time. So how do we let people know about the great things that nurses are doing um, or the educational opportunities, the resume uh, support for applying for internal jobs, the development opportunity, this is a infections and wounds uh, that they're doing next week. So they have an internal uh, or page that's targeted at nurses, but I can also like it and I see the positive pictures that they show of their nurses um, on, the, on the different units, highlighting uh, who is working there and what they're doing. So they use it also to create a positive image in the community so that people can approach the hospital and think highly of it and maybe they'll want to apply because they're looking for nursing jobs. They're also using YouTube. Someone said YouTube before for patient education. So this is one of their weight management clinics and they did FAQs in French and in English to help with the language barriers uh, in Canada, at least the bilingual ones. There's many more out there that they could be doing. And they asked um, the, the frequently asked questions in clinic so that people don't have to wait till they actually show up. If they're searching online, if they're wondering these things, they can make them available. Instead of just giving someone a pamphlet, they can actually direct them to these web pages if they have access to the internet so they can have these at home. And not just education about questions, uh, education about how to uh, prepare for surgery, how to prepare with going home, things that can help outcomes, reduce length of stay because it's low cost and we can help nurses or people that are interested in these topics around the world. Again, taking things they were doing, educating their nurses, but using these new tools to do them differently. Uh, figure one, and I'm sorry uh, if anyone's grossed out, I thought in a crowd of nurses this might be safe, um, but this is a, a website where they're sharing um, clinical images for education and collaboration, no patient information. So when you take that picture, it automatically detects a face and it allows you to scrub out personal identifiers. And you see discussions between attending surgeons and EMS. When do you see that in the hospital? Not very often. You see great conversations between all sorts of different levels focused on education, discussing cases, what's interesting, what was being considered. Uh, they're experimenting now putting calls out, uh, not uh, necessarily affecting um, patient care yet, but they're saying uh, if we just alert our 500,000 users that we need input on this image, what can we get as response and, and learn and help people that might not know what they're actually dealing with? So figure one's a really interesting app. Uh, patients like me. Has anyone in this room heard of patients like me? One person. Okay. Well, don't worry. Next year, everyone's hand will go up. Uh, so this is a really interesting website. So people often talk that patients don't want to have their health uh, information online. And it really goes and demonstrates that, well, that depends on what their preferences are. This is an open community uh, based in the United States um, where people can go on and upload their information related to their disease. They can connect with other patients and learn from them uh, and be part of uh, research and surveying by uh, researchers to learn about it. So you can go in there and put uh, your age, um, your activities of daily living score, your lab values, your weight, and track all sorts of information. And for myself, this is actually the only electronic medical record I have access to because my doctor doesn't have one for me. So I find it interesting, uh, even though I don't have uh, <coughs> something um, to really track and monitor at this point, but to be able to use it um, to track my health. So patients are going on there and sharing uh, and learning, and um, it's empowering them to deal with their health, and they're making that choice. Uh, discovery challenge. Um, by our care challenge. So this was a initiative that I took part in uh, helping work with where they were getting nurses from around the world to post their innovation. And instead of just doing an internal award where you look at submissions privately and then say, okay, these are the top five or, or 10 and they get prizes, you say, these are all the ideas that are out there. Take a look at this good work that's being done by nurses around the world. And you can comment on them, vote for the ones that you think are the best, and that's how we selected the prizes. And we saw really interesting things because some people were in France, some people were in Africa, and innovation looked very different based on where people were. And we tried to recognize that. Uh, in one country in Africa, they were building infection control carts uh, and distributing it around their hospitals, and they were able to demonstrate significant improvements. Uh, and in uh, the Philippines, they were doing podcasting and sharing ideas um, uh, about um, geriatrics. So it, it was different all around the world, and a really neat part was that people started to actually collaborate. They said, you're doing research like that? Let's talk, and let's start to work together uh, on our research. 
this is a website called uh, the Monday Life Project, <clears throat> and they were actually getting people to submit to crowdfund. Um, has anyone heard of the concept of crowdfunding? So that's where you just turn to friends and family or throw it out uh, with a prayer to the internet and say, this is my idea, uh, would you fund it? Um, and they were looking to get uh, a guitar for their nursing station, uh, a wagon um, uh, for this particular unit. So they were crowdfunding things for their pediatrics hospital using this website. Again, taking a concept that people are using uh, to fund all sorts of things uh, elsewhere and saying, what can we do with to help our patients or do something neat in healthcare? Uh, ER Nurse Pro. I don't know if anyone has a goal of going to the emergency room, but this is a great free podcast and website where you can download lectures and discussions about interesting topics for emergency department nurses. So a great opportunity for you to learn and educate yourself. So there's lots of opportunities out there, but yes, there's always risks. And people always think that, oh, Rob's got to be the person pushing adoption. Uh, he's always got to be pro, pro, pro. But really, what I try to do is always make sure there's balance. There should be discussion of the benefits and the risks, so it's always uh, being considered. And if there's a room where it's only the risks, yes, I for sure will advocate for potential advantages. But if it's only saying what's possible without considering the harm, uh, I think we need to bring the voice of that to the table. Could always keep, consider a balance to figure out how to move forward. And um, like I said before, we're giving out medications. We're doing things that have harm. There would be riots by physicians if we took away scalpels uh, or nurses who are using them. Uh, they have sharp edges, sure. They can harm patients and do all sorts of physical damage. Um, but we use them every day. And we learn and uh, we improve and reduce risk whenever we can. Uh, and there's examples. And when I started in 2006 and 7 talking about social media, the only thing I was hearing was nurses getting fired, nurses um, uh, getting dismissed. And yes, it, uh, there's risks. So a nursing student on the top left who posted a, a picture with placenta, um, and it was an interesting ethical debate uh, in some uh, research papers. Uh, was this patient information? I don't know, but I don't think it was appropriate, uh, especially the manner. Uh, and she was to, uh, taken out of her program uh, because she wasn't educated about what was appropriate. She didn't know or have this uh, filter. Uh, to the right, someone who was blogging opinions uh, about abortion that didn't uh, mesh with what the school thought was appropriate, they were dismissed from the school program. Uh, later, a judge overturned it uh, and found that that wasn't right because there weren't policies in place uh, that said what was allowed or not allowed. Uh, so a lot of challenges there. Uh, and a doctor on the bottom left whose anonymous blog, no name associated with it, it was under a pseudonym, uh, ended up in court uh, because the lawyer asked uh, if this was his blog. And you can't purge yourself in court, you can't lie. Um, so he had to admit that it was, so it became evidence in a trial. Um, so there our potential risks, or Instagram. Someone posted something, but they mentioned that it was to do with a very notable accident, um, so there's patient uh, information disclosed. And on the far right, it's not just novices, it's experts. Um, this was of a head of the National Health Service in the UK, and he took a picture with these clinicians, but they didn't look at the background, and there was a whiteboard with patient information in the background, and that was a breach. That was a huge issue, and they were the head of the NHS. And unfortunately, there's a bit of power imbalances. He wasn't dismissed the way that some of these nursing students were, uh, unfortunately. Uh, there were repercussions and a severe apology, and uh, they had to do all sorts of work to cover this up. Or not to cover it up, that's the wrong word, but to deal with this, to let patients know, um, to deal with um, uh, the, some uh, legal issues afterwards. Um, uh, these are the types of things that we need to think about. And how we can do this um, is by changing um, some of the metaphors we use. Instead of actually talking about uh, having a conversation on the bus about a patient, it's what are we posting online and how are we actually doing these things that we need to start to change. Because we have the knowledge and the skills and we can learn how to uh, apply uh, professional filters. Um, and this is how I try to explain it, um, is you start at the top. Um, what laws are actually in place? What's actually out there governing this? Well, there's privacy laws, there's copyright laws are some good examples. And uh, are you sharing patient information or something that you're not um, allowed to, uh, like sharing um, movies illegally? 
you don't probably want to do that kind of stuff. What about professional uh, regulations, standards of practice for ethics or confidentiality uh, or the therapeutic relationship with patients, friending patients um, on Facebook, for example? You have to consider these and, apply and decide how these things apply to your actual profession. Uh, what about employer agreements? Some hospitals uh, have things in their contracts or policies that say you, they don't want you to post on social media while you're inside the building or and they don't want you saying on certain sites that you are from a hospital because externally that might like look like you were saying Sunnybrook or UHN or wherever you work endorses the idea that you're posting and they don't want that. So we have to think about what has our employer said that we should or shouldn't be doing. Uh, then you have professional recommendations, and there is um, guidelines and advice that they put out there. It's not, necess not necessarily something that you're contractually obligated to, but it's a good idea to listen to and integrate it into what you're doing. And then finally, personal judgment. What's your critical judgment say? Is this something that you would be comfortable? Um, <laughs> social media calls. Um, is this something comfortable you'd be uh, you'd feel comfortable if your employer, if your family saw it. Uh, what about when you're not angry, upset? Would you really want to be out there? Uh, maybe not. So think about the things that you're posting and if you apply these filters, uh, you have the ability to consider risks um, and what you might want to actually engage in online. And so the RNEO has guidelines about, and they try to keep it really simple, about building your brand, being um, transparent about your intentions, not marketing things uh, without being clear that you're, you're, you're doing those types of things, respect, adding value, uh, being uh, diligent about what you're posting, uh, especially if you're um, uh, sharing um, links to things, make sure it's a credible source that you actually support. Read the articles that you're actually sharing. Uh, protect patient privacy. Uh, and again, good advice. If you're not sure, don't post it. The other part that I really like and it's interesting is get off the internet. There's still lots of networking that you can do in person. You need time away from this stuff as well. Uh, so keep a balance. And the American uh, Nursing Association, I think was also an interesting one to talk about. Again, pretty simple. Um, and one interesting thing um, is that they recommended reporting um, people uh, if they're doing something inappropriate. The Medical Association in the States takes a different tact. They recommend uh, contacting the individual about your concerns if you think privacy was violated or they're doing something wrong so that they can address it uh, before reporting it. So you, potentially you could address that. Like if you saw someone not washing their hands, you could say, would you want to wash your hands? You don't have to go and see a manager right away. But perhaps you could help reduce that harm or uh, intervene directly. So again, some good guidelines that I recommend checking out if you're interested in. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, actually making a plan. So hopefully some advice if people aren't getting uh, there yet. These are some steps that you can go through if you're interested in exploring how these tools could be used. So um, start by actually creating a profile, getting out there. Having things like your picture, a good quality, not one at the bar with your arm around someone or that's dark or has six of your family with you. It's great that you have family, but I don't know who I'm supposed to be connecting with. Uh, I don't know who I'm supposed to recognize. So having a nice picture of yourself. Uh, being clear in your name, uh, designation, and experience is a great thing. Because again, the way that I know you is by understanding um, the things that I haven't had a chance. It's really neat uh, when I get a business card, but when I get someone's LinkedIn profile, I can see the hospitals you've worked at. I can see some of those courses that you've done. I can ask you questions uh, that I might not have known to ask uh, based on what you've actually put out there. Uh, and then biography, explaining some of the things that you actually want taking time to prof uh, professionally craft a message that you're trying to convey. And these are things that you can put and save um, somewhere uh, on a Word document um, and have ready. So if you're opening a new uh, profile, it's easy to post the same things over and over again. I know as a technology adopter, I open many accounts, so I often just reuse the same biography, the same picture. I have that experience documented, so it's easy because I have to because uh, I'm trying to do uh, a lot of research and understanding of these tools. And Again, once you do that, doing it the second time becomes easy. You have the picture, whoops, you have the, the biography. You might be limited on different formats, and I'm not going to go through every social media uh, profile, but they often have these types of actual um, 
opportunities to input that information. So make sure you fill that out and have it complete so when other people do see you or, or you do reach out, they can get an insight. Because often I'll see people message me on something like Twitter and they won't have any, any actual biography. And so I don't know if they're a nurse, a patient, a doctor. I don't know how to engage them. I don't know what their interests might be. There's no link to a website like LinkedIn where I could follow up and get more of their biography. So take advantage of some of those features so that when others are actually searching uh, for an IEN, someone that speaks a certain language, that they'll come up. Because unfortunately when your resume is at home on the shelf, I don't have access to it. When you put some of this into something like LinkedIn, new opportunities have the uh, potential to be surfaced that wouldn't have been there before. Um, then connecting with others. So when you're getting started, a lot of these things you can follow or connect. So some of the things you can do are go through and look for topic experts. Can someone give me an example of where they're looking for work or want to move towards in healthcare? Yeah? Specialized in wound care. So that's a fantastic thing. So searching for um, uh, trauma surgeons, uh, dermatologists, interostomal therapists, there's lots of those terms that you can put in and find people. And that actually happened to align with something I'm doing some research and work in now. So that was my example. I searched for uh, nursing and wounds and there's Lots of profiles that I could follow, experts potentially, um, to actually uh, get information and have connection with. Organizations and publications, a lot of nursing journals, researchers, um, or magazines, they have these accounts where you can connect and follow them to make it easier. You don't have to get it in your mailbox anymore. Uh, journalists, uh, educators, uh, there's so many people that are um, great connections. Uh, and finding those people that are currently working at organizations you'd like to get into um, or in a role that you would like to have are great to have dialogue with and to learn what they're doing so that you can find out. Maybe there's a conference you didn't know about. Maybe there's a Twitter chat that you could join. You never know until you look for it. Sorry, Tina? You said you wanted to take questions as you were going? Absolutely. Um, what, what are the ethics or what's, what's, a, what's good advice for uh, if you're not on social media? Yeah. And they, they're obviously, you know, it's they're, they're from some somebody down the road. Mm -hmm. um, they don't work in my same field. They don't, and and I'm never on there, so I'm not yeah. exchanging. Yeah. Um, okay. Yet it's, it, it's I, always it's always I get in it. the back of my mind. Oh, there were those two friendly kids on Facebook. <laughs> oh, those two people on LinkedIn want to get yeah. in my, and I let it sit because I don't. I'm, I wouldn't actually be sharing anything with them. So what do you do? Uh, that's great advice. Um, so there's a few things, just I'll, I'll repeat the, the questions. Uh, so one is what happens if you're not necessarily active but you're getting lots of follower requests? What happens when someone connects with you and you don't know them? Um, and how do you deal with the notifications and the incoming requests? So uh, the next slide is going to help me with one of those questions. So one is when you're reaching out and connecting with someone, if there's a possibility, I always recommend you start explaining it and not just allowing it to say, um, so-and-so wants to connect with you on LinkedIn. And um, I, I had a nurse who was coming to this conference who did that. And what I do is I have an email that I send back when I don't recognize someone on LinkedIn, for example. So I say, thanks for reaching out. Do I actually know you? Have we met at a conference? Because I'm in a few places. Uh, or what's your interest or similarity? Why did you connect? And many times no one will write back. I just leave it. I don't accept the connection because maybe it was spam. Maybe it automatically sent out to every email they had ever had come into their inbox. Um, so I left it. So that's how I handle it on LinkedIn. Uh, on Twitter, I just don't look at who's following me anymore because there's uh, too many people. So I shut off that notification. And shutting off notifications is a lovely thing to do. Who feels like they want more notifications in their life? So I manage them. And the nice part is I'm subscribing to less uh, newsletters because I have things on Twitter that are going to keep me informed. Um, so hopefully that helps you with those three questions. And i got to move things forward. For, but quick question. Yeah. Actually, about like, connecting with social media, mm -hmm. is it a good idea or not? Like Sometimes they say, that you want, do you want to connect this, your account to whatever, Facebook? Mm -hmm. Uh, 
So the question was about should I connect my social media accounts across different places? And uh, I'd say use your scientific uh, and uh, research minds to look at what it's trying to do because there's some times that I will allow it and sometimes I won't. So there's not a yes or no. Um, LinkedIn has asked can they contact everyone in my email and I've said no. I don't want that. Um, other times it said, can I automatically put something from my presentations on in my profile? I've said yes. So read what it's doing. If you don't understand, it's always okay to say no. Yeah. Don't let them bully you. Exactly. Uh, explore collaborative tools. Um, people don't often think about it, and these are lesser known, but check them out. Things like Mendeley. So uh, think of a something that manages your music, but now for your research papers. So Mendeley allows you to organize all your PDFs, it helps you do citations, and it allows you to connect with researchers. When you look at uh, my research links um, where I shared, that's the library that I'm using because it puts all my citations in to that folder that I find on social uh, media and healthcare, and it allows me to publicly put it out there so anyone that's interested in that topic might find it, and they don't have to start from scratch anymore doing that research. They can build off what I've done. So Mendeley, I think, is a great tool. Google tools, uh, they have documents where you can collaborate. I started using this with classmates. Instead of emailing around a Word document and trying to figure out, does Tina have it? Does um, uh, Sally have it? Does Rick have it? Uh, having it online in one place where you can edit is great. Uh, they have tools for doing polls or surveys. We use that in an organization to do membership um, and to do some research and polling uh, um, for an uh, article and panel that we were uh, submitting to. So Google has lots of tools. Really, it's Google Drive um, is one of the main ones uh, that I, I highly recommend checking out. Uh, and then develop goals and projects. Once you have tools, uh, look for some ways to use it. And you have to be a little careful once you have a hammer Lots of things look like nails, but each tool has a purpose. And so once you understand them, you can apply them strategically and see how it can help you. And so one of the ways that I've looked at things uh, for goals was career development. So exploring online websites that could help me um, do things without having to attend a course, without having to go somewhere. And these are ones that I found for free. So RNAO has e-learning tools that anyone around the globe can sign up for some of these courses. There's e-health ones, some around addictions and mental health, and they were a great resource. There's a website called Coursera, and they partner with expert universities around the world, and I love Coursera. I've taken multiple courses. They're for free, but if you want a certificate, it's $75 to $150. And it's some of the best education that I've ever received, and it's specialized. So I don't have to enroll in a new program. I can target my learning or there. Didn't ask for anything, didn't send it to someone specifically, just mentioned the hospital and that they'd like to work there. The hospital's media company, or the, the group, responded, where did you want to work? Okay, well this is the manager, this is the person who actually does the education, and get in touch with them. Um, so it's not always going to be that quick a connection, but being open to different formats. And I posted um, nursing ideas, because it was interesting to see the view count goes one at a time when someone plays a video. But occasionally I'll get a message from someone that I knew from high school or from a conference and they'd say, hey, our master's class just watched three of your videos in school today. And that didn't go up uh, by more than one, but I found out 50 or 75 people had sat around watching it. Um, and for those who are educators or um, thinking about the organization, the kind of concrete steps that I, I'd suggest you consider are really making sure there's a policy. Many people don't have guidance and that's what creates risk for our staff and our uh, students and uh, new nurses uh, because they don't know what they can or can't do. So create some guidance. And then if you want to use it for patient education, try to actually align it. Is your hospital going through accreditation? Uh, are they trying to really focus on cardiac education? And focus around that because you're more likely to get the senior managers to buy into it and to support you in what you actually want to do. Uh, and then pick your audience and purpose. Be thoughtful about it. Um, is the community you want actually going to be online? Are they using one versus another? Maybe there's actually a niche community group. Uh, for example, there's different social networks that are more popular in China. So perhaps if you're trying to reach the immigrants from that country, you try those social media networks. And I can't actually work in those areas because I can't actually read any of the script that's on some of those pages. So it's a huge value asset that you could bring uh, by helping share some of those ideas. And then similarly, to the personal, experiment and analyze. Uh, we're scientifically minded as nurses, we're researchers uh, and we can compare and think about what we're doing and develop over time. Um, and uh, social media, the, the quality will come. I remember 
and I'm still a little bit embarrassed when I go back and look at some of those videos from the first days because I pulled out my webcam uh, from my laptop and you can hear the fan spin up in the background and the lighting isn't great but people found it helpful and sure it's not going to be on prime time TV but if someone's getting value out of that I'm okay with it being up as much as it pains me to sometimes go back and watch it. Um, so know that quality will improve over time as you learn to use these tools. Uh, some resources uh, for getting started with it, uh, a bit more from the organizational perspective, I put there in as well because this wasn't the focus of that talk. So in case people become interested or want to know how to have that discussion in their workplace, I think this is where I'd recommend starting. Uh, so I have, I think, one minute left. Uh, so if anyone has questions, I'm more than happy to talk. Someone in the back? Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> no, hugely. And um, I didn't want to draw attention to it, but I'm missing a slide. Um, and I think that was because the, the corruption issues that I had. But one of the ones that I wanted to say was uh, just reinforcing that, taking time offline or thinking how to do work differently. Uh, when you bring a computer into the workplace, it's not ideal if you document on the computer and the paper you were using before. Think about how these technologies let you do less. I really try to keep a lot of notifications out of my inbox and use that for work or family so that I get what I need. Um, and I've stopped signing up for some of those newsletters because Twitter keeps me updated um, and I actually have an email account that's just that. So thinking strategically about it and I measure um, or try to have specific times about when I'm going to do things. So the weekly Twitter chats, it's a one hour window um, that you could consider joining in. You don't have to be posting updates every day, all the time. So doing it strategically and that's what I really um, um, try to encourage is that kind of scientific analytical mindset of am I getting something out of it do I want to spend this much time on it maybe the answer is yes maybe the answer is no but you have to use that critical insight for yourself what's your goal is it finding work then maybe LinkedIn and getting your resume up is the best thing not trying to tweet every day and become the expert in wound care or whatever it is first it's it's starting with some of those basic things and it's it's not easy and that's why I highly recommend looking at notification settings for any website I love on LinkedIn in, how you can turn them off, get a weekly digest, a daily update. So I join lots of different groups, but I'm very selective about which ones I'll let um, into my inbox. And I find it's helpful because I can go onto LinkedIn and, and look at those updates when I have the time, but if I don't, I can focus on the things that matter, uh, family, uh, and uh, the things I have to do for my work. And yeah, sorry for exhausting. I could talk for hours about this. I tried to make it pack, but hopefully, again, it gets you a little excited to think about what you guys can do to advance your career and help the profession. Thank you.